as I said when I was asked about this in China, I don't take these comments personally. Because it seems as if this is a phrase he's used repeatedly, including directed at the Pope and others. And so I think it seems to be just a habit, a way of speaking for him. But as I said in China, we want to partner with the Philippines on the particular issue of narco-traffickers. Which is a serious problem in the Philippines. It's a serious problem in the United States and around the world. On that narrow issue, we do want to make sure that the partnership we have is consistent with international norms and rule of law. So we're not going to back off our position that if we're working with a country whether it's on anti-terrorism. whether it's on going after drug traffickers as despicable as these networks may be. As much damage as they do, it is important from our perspective to make sure that we do it the right way. Because the consequences of when you do it the wrong way is innocent people. Get hurt and you have a whole bunch of unintended consequences that don't solve the problem. It has no impact on our broader relationship with the Philippine people. On the wide range of programs and security cooperation that we have with this treaty ally. And it certainly has no impact in terms of how we interpret our obligations to continue to build. On the long-standing alliance that we have with the Philippines however that may play itself out. And my hope and expectation is, is that as President Duterte and his team get acclimated to his new position. That they're able to define and clarify what exactly they want to get done.
how that fits in with the work that we're already doing with the Philippine government. And hopefully it will be on a strong footing by the time the next administration comes in. As far as MR. Trump, I think I've already offered my opinion. I don't think the guy is qualified to be President of the United States. And every time he speaks, that opinion is confirmed. And I think the most important thing for the public and the press is to just listen to what he says and follow. up and ask questions about what appear to be either contradictory or uninformed or outright wacky ideas. There is this process that seems to take place over the course of the election season where Somehow behavior that in normal times we would consider completely unacceptable and outrageous becomes normalized. And people start thinking that we should be grading on a curve. But I can tell you from the interactions that I've had over the last eight or nine days with foreign leaders. That this is serious business. And you actually have to know what you're talking about and you actually have to have done your homework. And when you speak, it should actually reflect thought-out policy that you can implement. And I have confidence that if, in fact, people just listen to what he has to say. And look at his track record or lack thereof that they'll make a good decision. Elise who? Question, thank you very much, MR. President. On North Korea, there's increasing evidence that China isn't enforcing economic sanctions. Namely when it comes to coal.
So what's the next move there in your remaining four and a half months in office? And second, is it time for a fundamental rethink of North Korea policy? Given that all these years of condemnations and increasing sanctions haven't led to a desired outcome, thank you. President Obama, well, those are good questions. In my meeting with President Xi, we emphasized the importance of full implementation of the UN sanctions that have been put forward. I can tell you that based on not only their presentations but actually intelligence and evidence that we've seen. China has done more on sanctions implementation than they have on some of the previous UN Security Council sanctions. But you are absolutely right that there are still places where they need to tighten up. And we continue to indicate to them the importance of tightening those up. You may have noted that China continues to object to the THAAD deployment in the Republic of Korea. One of our treaty allies. And what I've said to President Xi directly is that we cannot have a situation. where we're unable to defend either ourselves or our treaty allies against. Increasingly provocative behavior and escalating capabilities by the North Koreans. And I indicated to him that if the THAAD bothered him, particularly since it has no purpose. Other than defensive and does not change the strategic balance between the United States and China. that they need to work with us more effectively to change Pyongyang's behavior. Now, when it comes to changing Pyongyang's behavior, it's tough.
it is true that our approach my approach since I've been president is to not reward bad behavior. And that was based on the fact that, before I came into office. You had a pattern in which North Korea would engage in some provocative action and, as a consequence of the equivalent of throwing a tantrum, Countries would then try to placate them by giving them humanitarian aid or providing other concessions. Or engaging in dialogue, which would relieve some of the pressure. And then they would just go right back to the same provocative behavior later. And so our view was, that wasn't working, let's trying something else. Now, it is entirely fair to say that they have continued to engage in the development of their nuclear program and these ballistic missile tests. And so we are constantly examining other strategies that we can take. Close consultations with Republic of Korea and Japan, as well as China and Russia and others who are interested parties. And we do believe that if there are any signs, at any point, that North Korea is serious about dialogue. Around denuclearization in the Korean Peninsula, that we'll be ready to have those conversations. It's not as if we are looking for a problem, or avoiding a willingness to engage diplomatically. But diplomacy requires that Pyongyang meet its international obligations. And not only is it failing to meet those international obligations, it's not even suggesting that they have any intention. To do so anytime in the future regardless of the inducements that might be put on the table. So, look, we are deeply disturbed by what's happened.
we are going to make sure that we put our defensive measures. In place so that America is protected, our allies are protected. We will continue to put some of the toughest pressure that North Korea has ever been under as a consequence of this behavior. Can I guarantee that it works? No. But it is the best options that we have available to us right now. And we will continue to explore with all parties involved, including China. Other potential means by which we can bring about a change in behavior. Bob Woodruff Question, thank you, MR. President. First of all. I just want to let you know that this is going to be more of a personal question for you. We are almost the same exact age, born August 1961, but I'm two weeks younger than you. President Obama, you know, I noticed that when we were in the gym together. You were working out a little harder than me. So those two weeks clearly are making a difference. Question, but I want to ask you about some of your thoughts all those years ago. Since we were living in those days of the Vietnam era. What were your thoughts about Vietnam, the war at that time, and certainly as time went on? but more importantly, about the secret war, when you found out about that, and also as time went by. Given what you learned about that and what you see now, and what you've witnessed when you're here. Do you think you should apologize fully to the country of Laos?
And one other very important thing, too, is, for those American veterans who did serve in the secret war. Those that are special ops, CIA. Certainly pilots that dropped the bombs those are the ones that targeted known enemies in a war they did not create. Would you be comfortable, in Laos, calling them heroes as we do with those that served in Iraq and Afghanistan? President Obama, well, because we're the same age, you'll recall that at the peak of the war. We were still too young, I think, to fully understand the scope of what was taking place. It was the tail end of the war where we're entering high school and starting to understand the meaning of it. But at that point, it was I think the debate had raged. Even those who had been strong supporters of the war recognized. There needed to be some mechanism to bring it to an end. So I can't say that I was so precocious that I had deep thoughts about it at the time. Other than the images that we all saw on television. Standing here now, in retrospect, I think what I can say is that the United States was on the right side of history when it came to the Cold War. There may have been moments, particularly here in Southeast Asia, in which in our singular focus on defeating an expansionist and very aggressive communism. that we didn't think through all the implications of what we did as policy makers. And certainly when you see the dropping of cluster bombs. Trying to figure out how that was going to be effective particularly since part of the job was to win over hearts. And minds how that was going to work, 
I think with the benefit of hindsight. We have to say that a lot of those consequences were not ones that necessarily served our interests.